Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the ABO blood group system. The ABO blood group system is the most important of all the blood group systems in all of blood bank. It was actually the very first blood group system that was even discovered uh, back in 1901 by a man named Carl Landsteiner. And Landsteiner drew his own blood as well as the blood of a few colleagues, separated the red blood cells from the serum, and began mixing various red blood cells with various serum samples. So this was the first documentation of any type of blood typing. So with these, he was able to discover the A, B, and O blood types. The group AB blood type was discovered by a couple of uh, Landsteiner's colleagues about a year later. Just as a note, these blood bank lectures are going to be focusing a lot on antigens and antibodies. So it's critical to understand what these terms mean. So I recommend reviewing immunology uh, before listening to this lecture. You can do that by checking out another one of my lecture videos called Immunology for Blood Bankers, which I will uh, provide a link in the description of this video. So go ahead and watch that if you haven't already. So in short, genetics determine what antigens are going to be present on the surface of the red blood cell. And if a patient is exposed to a foreign red blood cell antigen via blood transfusion or a pregnancy, the body's immune system can recognize this antigen as foreign and develop an antibody that is specific for that antigen. So that's actually what all the blood bank is about. Um, so antigens and antibody interactions. So let's get back to the ABO blood group system. The ABO blood group consists of three different genes, an A gene, a B gene, and an O gene. The locus for these genes is located on chromosome number nine. Along with these genes, there are two different antigens in this blood group system, A antigen and B antigen. These are present on the surface of the red blood cell. It's important to know that there is no O antigen in this blood group system, although there is an O gene. And this is because the O gene is considered a silent amorph because no antigen is produced from the inheritance of the gene. There are three different antibodies that are possible in the ABO blood group system, anti-A antibody, anti-B antibody, and anti-AB antibody. Now this is where the ABO blood group uh, systems differ from other blood groups. So earlier on in this slide, I mentioned that the body will develop antibodies to certain foreign blood group antigens if they are exposed via transfusion or pregnancy. This is not the case for the ABO system. Anti-A antibody, anti-B antibody, and anti-AB antibody are naturally occurring, meaning they just occur without any exposure to foreign antigens. The ABO blood group system has four major blood groups, A, B, AB, and O. Now let's talk about these on the next slide here. So this is a chart that you absolutely need to know, uh, basically like the back of your hand. Um, if you have already reviewed the genetics lecture, and if you haven't um, already before watching this, please stop and go watch it. But if you have already watched that, you will know the difference between genotype and phenotype. So genotype is the person's actual genetic makeup, so the genes that they have inherited from their parents. The phenotype is the outward expression of those genes, so in this case, the patient's blood type. So if they are, are uh, an O or A or B or AB, so that's their phenotype. I have the ABO blood group uh, systems phenotypes listed on the left-hand side, uh, side of this table. And in the second column is their possible phenotypes. Then in the third column, their ABO antigens that are present on the red blood cells. And then lastly, in the final column is the corresponding naturally occurring antibodies. So for O blood group patients, so this is in the first uh, row here, uh, their genotype is always going to be O slash O or OO, meaning they inherited a, an O gene from each parent. Um, they have no ABO antigens present on their red blood cells because, again, O is a silent amorph. They do have anti-A and anti-B uh, antibodies present in their serum. So this means if an O blood type person receives blood from an A blood type person, their anti-A antibodies in their serum will react with the A antigens present on the A blood type donor and agglutinate, causing a transfusion reaction. This would be the same if an O blood type person receives blood from a B blood type person. 
Their anti-B antibodies in their serum will react with the B antigens present on the blood, uh, the B blood type donor and agglutinate causing a transfusion reaction. So for this next row here, for the A blood group, their genotype can either be A slash A or AA, meaning they inherit an A gene from both parents, or AO or A slash O, meaning they inherit one A gene from one parent and one O gene from the other parent. And since the O gene is a silent amorph, it doesn't express, so just the A gene does. So they have A antigens present on their red blood cells and naturally occurring anti-B antibodies present in the serum. So this means if an A blood type person receives blood from a B blood type person, their anti-B antibodies in their serum will react with the B antigens present on the B blood type donor and agglutinate causing a transfusion reaction. Now for this third uh, row here, for the B blood group, their genotype can either be BB or B slash B, meaning they inherit a B gene from both parents, or BO or B slash O, meaning they inherit one B gene from one parent and one O gene from the other parent. And since again, the O gene is a silent amorph, it doesn't express um, in the case of the BO um, genetic inheritance. So just the B uh, gene does. So they have B antigens present on their red blood cells and naturally occurring anti-A antibodies present in the serum. So this means if a B uh, blood type person receives blood from an A blood type person, their anti-A antibodies in their serum will react with the A antigens present on the A blood type donor and agglutinate causing a transfusion reaction. Now for AB blood uh, type patients in this final row here, their genotype is AB or A slash B, meaning they inherit an A gene from one parent and one B gene from the other parent. So both A and B genes are codominant, meaning they are both phenotypically expressed. So they have both A and B antigens present on their red blood cell surface. They do not have any naturally occurring ABO blood group antibodies present in their serum. Because of this, they can receive red blood cell donations from any blood type. So this is a drawing of what group A blood looks like. Um, this yellow part here represents the serum and the red circles are uh, just a depiction of red blood cells. So in an A blood type person, they have A antigens present on the red blood cells, as you can see here, depicted as these little blue squares. And in the serum, an A blood type person will have anti-B antibodies floating around in their serum. So this anti -B, um, these anti-B antibodies don't do anything uh, to these, these red blood cells because there's no B antigens on any of these uh, red blood cells because the patient is an A, uh, an A patient. So no agglutination happens. So now if B blood was given to this patient, so B antigen blood, so the uh, red cells have B antigen present on the surface, um, these anti-B antibodies would recognize that as, hey, we, we are um, the corresponding antibody to this antigen and they're gonna agglutinate so bind to those B antigens and cause a transfusion reaction. So what would happen if a patient, um, this A group patient received O uh, donor blood, right? So that would be fine. Um, a patients can get O blood. And the reason for that is what antibodies do they have present in their serum? They have anti-B antibodies. And does O group blood have any antigens on it? Do they have B antigens present? No, they don't. They don't have any antigens. Um, present ABO antigens on them. So they don't have A or a B. So group O um, blood can be given to group A patients. So this is a drawing of what group B blood looks like. So in a B blood type person, they have B antigens present on their red blood cells, as you can see here depicted as these pink squares. And in the serum, a B blood type person will have anti-ant antibodies floating around in the, uh, floating around. So these anti-A antibodies don't do anything in this particular patient because there are no A antigens on any red blood cells, so no agglutination happens. So now if A blood was given to this patient, so A blood from a donor, um, their anti-A antibodies in the serum would agglutinate to those A antigens and cause a transfusion reaction. So again, let's talk about it. So they could get B blood could get other B blood, right? That would be fine because there's no corresponding antibody. So this patient has anti-A antibodies that are naturally occurring in their serum. 
Um, could they get O blood? And the answer to that is yes, because again, what antigens do O patients have? Do they have A or B antigens present on the red cells? No, they don't. So um, these anti-A antibodies are going to do nothing to those uh, O um, those O red blood cells. So uh, B patients can get B blood and they can also get O blood. So this is a drawing of what group AB blood looks like. In an AB blood type person, they have both A and B antigens present on their red blood cells, as you can see here depicted as these pink and blue squares. And in this serum, an AB blood type person will have um, no naturally occurring antibodies. And because of this, they can receive any blood type, um, any blood type uh, donations. So they can receive A blood, right? And why can they do that? Because there's no antibodies towards anti-A, right? They can receive B blood. And why is that? Because there's no antibodies for, there's no anti-B antibodies um, in the serum of an AB uh, patient. Can they receive AB blood? Absolutely they can, because again, there's no naturally occurring antibodies. So there's no A or B antibodies present. And also, can they receive O blood? The answer to that is yes, they can, because O blood does not have any antigens and there's no um, naturally occurring antibodies to an O, right? Um, so uh, a blood, AB blood can, and can get any um, uh, red blood cell. So this is a drawing of what group O blood looks like. In a group O patient, uh, there are no A or B antigens present on the surface of the red blood cells, but they do have both naturally occurring anti-A and anti-B antibodies present in their serum. So because of this, group O patients can only have group O red blood cells for donation. And why is that? It's because they have anti-A and anti-B antibodies. So if A blood was given to this patient, their anti-A antibodies would agglutinate to those A antigens and cause a transfusion reaction. If B blood was given to this patient, their anti-B antibodies would agglutinate to those B antigens and cause a transfusion reaction. And of course, to go even further, if they were given group AB blood, obviously that wouldn't work either because AB blood has A and B antigens present on their red blood cell surface. And group O patients have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies present in their serum. So this is a chart showing the frequencies of ABO blood groups in the United States. Blood group O is the most common blood type. Next is group A, then group B, and then group AB. So blood bankers should know the different frequencies of the blood groups in each ethnic group as listed here in this chart. And honestly, most specifically, um, probably within the whites and the black population is probably the, um, the most uh, important for you to know um, for the purpose of this uh, lecture or course. So again, antibodies in the ABO blood group system are naturally occurring. They are initiated at birth, but are not detectable in the serum until around three to six months of age. Um, they also do decline with age as well. So an elderly patient's anti-A and anti-B antibodies may also uh, become weaker or uh, could not, uh, may not be able to be detected in the serum. And we'll talk about this a little later on in this lecture. Antibodies in the ABL blood group are generally IgM and they activate complement. So they react at room temperature and generally give strong reactions of four plus during ABO testing. ABO antibodies can be IgG um, and they can only cross the placenta if they are um, this IgG antibody class, but predominantly they are IgM. So the most important test in the blood bank is ABO testing or ABO typing. The ABO typing procedure includes both forward grouping and reverse grouping. Forward grouping or uh, front typing or forward typing involves testing the patient's red blood cells with known reagent anisera. The known anisera contains either anti-A antibodies, anti-B antibodies, and there's also an anisera with anti-AB antibodies, although that's not used routinely. The reverse grouping or back typing is testing a patient's serum or plasma with known A red blood cells and known B red blood cells to determine what ABO antibodies are present. I have a separate video showing the ABO testing procedure in detail. Please go check that video out. I will leave the link to it below. This is a general overview of the procedure. 
So the forward blood typing or front typing procedure is testing a patient's red blood cells with known reagent anosera. The picture on the left-hand side of this slide shows the anosera that we use in the blood bank for ABL forward or front typing. The reagent in the blue vial contains anti-A antibodies. The yellow vial contains anti-B antibodies. The clear reagent contains anti-D antibodies. They will always be these specific colors to avoid confusion or um, ABL mistyping. For the front type procedure, you will need three tubes. The tubes should be labeled with the patient's information and also labeled with whatever reagent is going in them. So either anti-A, anti-B, or anti-D. One drop of a patient's 2 to 5% red, um, red blood cell suspension goes into the first tube. I reviewed how to make a red blood cell suspension in the ABO testing procedure video. Um, so one drop of that suspension and one drop of the anti-A anisera reagent go in the first tube. The second tube should be labeled with patient identification and anti-B. One drop of the patient's red cell suspension and one drop of the anti-B anisera should be put into this tube. In the third tube, labeled with patient identifiers and anti-D, one drop of the patient's red cell suspension and one drop of the anti-D anisera should go in it. These tubes are then centrifuged for approximately 20 seconds and the reactions are read using the agglutination viewer. Again, these reactions, I go over them in that um, ABO blood typing uh, video. If a patient has A antigens present on their red blood cell, there will be agglutination in the first tube because the antiseros anti-A antibodies bind and agglutinate those A antigens. If a patient has B antigens present on their red blood cell, there will be agglutination in the second tube because the antiseros anti-B antibodies bind and agglutinate those B antigens. The anti-D is used to determine a patient's RH status. So anti-D is part of the RH blood group system, which I'll discuss in a later presentation on the RH blood group system. So if a patient is RH positive, there will be agglutination in this third tube. If there's no agglutination in a tube in this type, this means that the patient is lacking that specific antigen. The reverse grouping or back typing is also a part of the ABO blood typing procedure. This is where the patient's serum or plasma is mixed with red cells that have known A antigen and known B antigen on them. This is used to determine what ABO antibodies are present in their serum or plasma. The picture on the left-hand side of the slide shows the reagents used for this typing. The reagent labeled A1 contains red blood cells that have A antigen on them. The first tube should be labeled with patient identification and A1 cells written on it. One drop of this A1 reagent goes in the first tube, along with two drops of the patient's serum or plasma. The reagent labeled B contains red blood cells with B antigens present on them. The second tube should be labeled with patient identification and have B cells written on it. One drop of this B reagent goes into the second tube, along with two drops of the patient's serum or plasma. Then these tubes should be centrifuged for approximately 20 seconds. If the patient's serum or plasma contains anti-A antibodies, the tube with the A1 cell reagent should agglutinate because these cells contain A antigen on them. If the patient contains anti-B antibodies in their serum or plasma, the tube with the B cell reagent should agglutinate because these cells contain B antigen. Again, this is just a brief overview. To see the procedure step by step, please check out the video that I've listed below. The forward and reverse grouping tests are performed together to make up the ABO testing. So when I say we're ABO testing a patient, I mean we're doing that forward and reverse grouping test. This is a test we're constantly performing in the blood bank, and you should know the procedure and be able to perform it with 100% accuracy as a blood banker. It's also critical to know what the expected forward and reverse grouping should look like for each of the ABO blood groups. So for a patient that has group A blood, they should have a 4 plus agglutination reaction with anti-A anisera and a negative reaction with anti-B anisera. This is because group A red blood cells have A antigen and no B antigen present. A group A person should have a negative reaction with A1 cells and a 4 plus reaction with B cells. This is because they should not have any anti-A antibodies in their serum or plasma and should have anti-B antibodies present in their serum or plasma. 
Group B patients should have a negative reaction with anti-A antisera and a 4 plus reaction with anti-B because they do not have A antigen present on their red blood cells and they do have B antigen present on those red blood cells. Group B patients should have a 4 plus reaction with A1 cells and a negative reaction with B cells. And this is because they should have anti-A antibodies in their serum or plasma. It should not have any anti-B antibodies present. Group AB patients should have a 4 plus reaction with both the anti-A and anti-B antisera. This is because they have both A and B antigens present on their red blood cells. Group AB patients should have a negative reaction with A1 and B cells, and that's because they should not have any anti-A or anti-B pre uh, antibodies present in their serum or plasma. Now, group O patients should have negative reactions with both the anti-A and anti-B antisera. And this is because they do not have uh, A or B antigens present on the surface of their red blood cells. They should have four plus reactions with both the A1 and B cells because they should have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies present in their serum or plasma. The H blood group system is interconnected with the ABO blood grouping system. The H antigen, or big H antigen, is a precursor structure on which A and B antigens are created. There are two genes in this blood group system, big H and little h. The locus for these genes is located on chromosome number 19. When someone inherits a big H gene from one of their parents, this results in the formation of the big H antigen. Like with O in the ABO blood group system, the little h gene is a silent amorph, and meaning it does not produce an antigen. So all it takes is one big H gene from either parent for the big H antigen to be formed on the red blood cell. The big H antigen must be present in order to form either A or B antigens from the ABO blood group system. When no big H gene is inherited, so meaning a patient gets one little H gene from one parent and another little H gene from another parent, so because of this, no big H antigen can be formed. This genotype is called Bombay O. The little h, little h phenotype, or Bombay O phenotype, is extremely rare. It was first discovered in the 1950s in Bombay, India, hence the name Bombay O. In people with this blood type, no big H antigen can be produced because no big H gene is inherited. This prevents the formation of A or B antigens uh, uh, on the red blood cell, um, so the patient will type as an O patient. The serum in patients with Bombay O phenotype have a naturally occurring anti-big H antibody. So why is this significant? So if this little H, uh, little H phenotype is, is extremely rare, that means that an overwhelming majority of people have that big H antigen. So this is problematic because Bombay O's have anti-big H antibodies. So if they get a transfusion of blood that has that big H antigen present on the red blood cells, their naturally occurring big H antibody is going to agglutinate to that, those big H antigen red cells and cause a transfusion reaction. So basically this means that Bombay O patients can only receive um, other Bombay O blood. So a couple of slides ago, I said that the H blood group system is interconnected with the ABO blood grouping system and that the big H antigen is a precursor structure on which A and B antigens are created. So let's talk about this a little bit more. The formation of A, B, and big H antigens results from genes at three separate areas, ABO, uh, big H, little h, and SE, which is a secretor, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. These three genes are responsible for coding specific glycosyl transferases. So these glycosyl transferases are responsible for adding sugars to a basic precursor material to which sugars are attached. When a, a person inherits one big H gene, this inheritance causes the production of the enzyme alpha 2 l fucosal transferase. And this transferase transfers the L-fucose to the terminal galactose of a precursor substance. Sugars that are in the terminal positions of precursor substances are called the immunodominant sugars. So for the big H gene, the immunodominant sugar is L-fucose. Fucose. So this is present in almost 100% of the population, so like 99.9%. Um, so you can see that the Bombay O blood type is super rare. So we have to have a big H antigen in order for the A and B genes to be expressed. 
If the patient has an A gene inherited, this A gene causes the formation of N-acetylgalactosamine transferase. And this is responsible for adding the N-acetylgalactosamine sugar to the big H substance on the surface of the red blood cell. And basically what this means is this sugar is responsible for the expression of A. So you have to have big H in order to properly express A or B uh, genes to, to form A and B antigens. If a patient has a B gene inherited, this B gene causes the formation of D-galactosal transferase. And this D-galactosal transferase is, um, is responsible for attaching the sugar D-galactose to the H substance. This sugar is responsible for the expression of B. So I included in this chart that gives kind of a summation of what is important to know here. So you need to memorize the gene and what glycosal transferase that it encodes for, as well as the corresponding immunodominant sugar. Um, so remember, the big H gene must be inherited in order for A or B antigens to um, be expressed. There are two types of precursor substances that convert um, to um, be con that can be converted to big H substance and the A or B antigens. So the type two is found on the surface of the red blood cells, and the N-acetylglucosamine has a beta 1-4 linkage. Type ones are soluble and are found in plasma and body fluids. The terminal galactose on type one precursor substances is attached to the N-acetylglucosamine in a beta 1-3 linkage. The O gene does not produce a transferase. The A gene tends to have a higher concentration of transferase in comparison to the B gene. So this leads to the conversion of practically all of the H antigen on the red blood cell surface to the A1 antigen sites on the surface of the red blood cell. The amount of H antigen for each blood group is as follows. So the highest amount of H antigen, or big H antigen, is in group O individuals followed by group A2. So we have not discussed A2 yet, so hold tight, we'll get there in the coming slides. Then group B patients, followed by group A2B patients, then A1 blood type patients, followed lastly by A1 blood type patients. So you do need to know the order of this. So if I were to ask you which of the following of these blood types has the most big H antigen present, uh, you should be able to identify it. Or, you know, on the reverse of that, which of these has the least amount of H, uh, big H antigen present, you should be able to answer that. Ulex europius is a scientific name for a plant known as the common gorse. So this picture on the right hand side of the slide shows this specific plant. So material is removed from the seeds of this plant and we call this extract a lectin. So the lectin from this Ulex europius plant acts like an antibody directed towards the big H antigen. So the more big H antigen that is present on the surface of the red blood cell, the, strongest this, uh, the stronger this reagent is going to react with it. So there's another lectin that we use in uh, blood bank, and actually we use it more frequently than this Ulex lectin. Um, but this other lectin is called Dolichos biflorus, and we'll talk about that one later on in the presentation. But I wanted to at least bring it up so you um, wanted, I want to make sure that you knew that there was a difference. There's two different lectins that we use. A, B, and H antigens, of course, are on the surface of the red blood cell. They can also be found in all of the body's secretions as soluble antigens. They can be in saliva, digestive juices, urine, bile, breast milk, and also in amniotic fluid, pleural fluid, pericardial fluid, and peritoneal fluid. And this is dependent on two separate things. The first being what ABO inheritance they have. So if they are a B patient, obviously they aren't gonna have A antigen present in their body secretions, but will only have B and H antigen present in those secretions. And of course, if they are an O patient, they're not gonna have A and B antigens present in their secretions. And secondly, um, this depends on the patient's inheritance of another set of genes called secretor genes, which we will talk about on the next slide. Like the H blood group system, the secretor blood group system is interconnected with the ABO blood group system. There are two genes in this blood group system, big SE and little SE, and these genes are located on chromosome 19. They are linked with the big H and little H genes and also with Lewis genes. Please refer to my presentation on the Lewis blood group system for information on the Lewis genes. So around 80% of the population in the United States are secretors. And to be a secretor, at least one copy of the big SE gene needs to be inherited. 
So secretors can be homozygous for big, for big SE, so two copies of the big SE gene, or they can be heterozygous, so one copy of the big SE gene and one copy of the little SE gene. Around 20% or so of the population in the United States are non-secretors, and those are the people that have no big SE gene at all. These are the people that are homozygous for the little SE gene, so two copies of the little SE gene. So when I say the term secretor versus non-secretor, I'm meaning a secretor is a patient that has the ability to secrete A, B, and H soluble antigens in their secretions, and a non-secretor is a patient that does not have that ability. The secretor system regulates the formation of the big H antigen, and since the big H antigen is responsible for the expression of A and B antigens, the secretor system subsequently regulates A and B antigens and secretions. A, B, and H antigens on the red blood cell surface are glycolipids, whereas the secreted A, B, and H antigens are glycoproteins. The big SE gene doesn't affect the formation of A, B, or H antigens on the surface of the red blood cells, only the presence of these antigens in the body fluid secretions. Recall that the glycosyl transferase that is created by the A gene is the N-acetogalactosaminyl transferase. There are two of these transferases, one that is coded by the A1 gene and one that is coded by the A2 gene. Around 80% of group A blood patients have the A1 gene, and around 20% of group A blood patients have the A2 gene. There are other uh, rare subgroups of A, but we deal primarily with these two, A1 and A2. This chart shows how the A subgroups react. So the first row here in this table shows the A1 subgroup. This has the A1 antigen present. It will have a positive reaction with anti-A anisera. The second column shows the A2 subgroup, which has the A antigen present. Just like the A1 subgroup, the A2 subgroup will also have a positive reaction with anti-A anisera. And how they differ is their reaction to anti-A1 lectin. Anti-A1 lectin has another name, and you've heard it before. Remember the term dolichos biflorus? So this is anti-A1 lectin. So this lectin helps us determine between A1 and A2 subgroups. An A1 subgroup patient is going to have a positive reaction with dolichos biflorus, and an A2 subgroup is going to have a negative reaction. So what I'm talking about here is here. So the reaction with anti-A1 lectin. So A1 is gonna have a positive reaction, and A2 is going to have a negative reaction. So that's how we determine between the two. There are some subgroups of A that are weaker than A2, but these are very infrequent, accounting for less than one percentage of group A patients. And some of these patients may also form um, anti-A1 antibodies. Like with A subgroups, weak B subgroups exist as well. However, they are very rare and less frequent than the A subgroups are. So these subgroups do have clinical significance. So let's say for an example, um, a patient came into the blood bank and got an ABO blood type and they had a subgroup that was not properly identified. They'd be probably listed as an O blood patient, which of course is inaccurate. Now, if they were needing a blood transfusion, they would be given O donor blood. And this would have minimal consequences because O doesn't have any A or B antigens present. Um, so it would not react. Now let's say a person comes in and donates their blood and they have a subgroup that was improperly identified. So their blood uh, would be listed incorrectly as an O blood group. And that O blood group could be given to an O blood group patient and this would cause a transfusion reaction. So my point here is that mistypes can cause transfusion reactions. So it's critical that each patient is correctly ABO typed every single time that they come into the blood bank. Now an ABO discrepancy is when the expected positive and negative reactions are not observed in the forward grouping and reverse grouping. There are four main types of ABO typing discrepancies. So this is just an example of what we're talking about, this, this little chart here, this table here. As you can see in this chart, the patient has a four plus reaction with anti-A anisera and a negative reaction with anti-B anisera. This um, is a result that is expected of an A patient. Um, so what I'm saying here is 
these results here, anti A and anti B results are um, is suggestive of an A patient. So now let's look at the back type of this patient. What should be the results here? An A patient should have a negative reaction with A1 cells here um, and a four plus reaction with B cells. But this patient has a negative reaction in both the A1 and the B cell. So this is an ABO discrepancies. This front type is not me um, meshing or um, corresponding correctly with the back type. Um, so this is, again, this is an ABO discrepancy. Um, and you can't resolve out the patient's blood type on it because it's, it's incorrect. There, there's a discrepancy here. So we're gonna be talking about these different kinds of discrepancies in the next coming slides. So group one discrepancies are those that have unexpected reactions in the back type. So unexpected reactions with the A1 and B cells. This is due to either weakly reacting or missing antibodies. Group one discrepancies are the most common of ABO discrepancies. So this example in this chart here shows a group one ABO discrepancy. So the patient has a negative reaction uh, with anti-A anisera, as well as with anti-B anisera. So here's the negative reaction in anti-A, and here's the negative reaction in anti-B. So um, based on these reactions, uh, we can kind of conclude that this is likely an O blood group patient. So with an O blood group patient, the back type should react strongly with four plus reactions. So with the A1 and B cells here, right? Um, but um, so as you can see in this example, this patient had a negative reaction with both of these cells and this front type is not is not uh, corresponding correctly with the back type. So this is a discrepancy. Um, so these group one discrepancies will occur in newborns as their back type antibodies are not detectable until three to six months of age. This can also be seen in patients that are immunocompromised. So those those are people that have certain cancers or those that are immuno on immunosuppressive drugs or just immunosuppressed in general. Uh, group one discrepancies also uh, can occur in the elderly population where the ABO antibody production is just decreased. Uh, patients with chimerism, so the presence of two cell populations can have this discrepancy as well. Um, and this uh, phenomenon can occur from bone marrow transplants. Now that we've talked about group one discrepancies, let's talk about the resolutions for these. Because, you know, if we have these discrepancies in the blood bank, what do you do? I mean, you can't just result it out. I mean, that doesn't, that's not okay. So we need to resolve them. Um, so the patient in this particular chart has a negative reaction with anti A anisera as well as with anti B anisera. So here's negative reaction here and a negative reaction there. Um, so again, this is likely an O blood group patient, and we can determine that by the front type. So in an O blood group patient, the back type should react strongly with four plus reactions, so with the A1 and B cells. But as you can see in this example, that's not happening. I completely missed that zero. <laughs> so zero there and a zero there. So these are negative reactions uh, with both of the A1 and the B cells. Um, so the first thing to do with this type of discrepancy is to get a patient history. So if the patient is an infant under six months of age, this would explain the missing back type because they don't produce those uh, naturally occurring ABO antibodies yet. Um, if the patient is elderly or an immunocompromised individual, the best way to resolve the missing back type is to enhance the reactions of that missing back type. So the A1 and B cells should be incubated with the patient's serum for 15 to 30 minutes at room temperature. And after that amount of time, um, they need to be spun and the reactions graded again. If the back type is still missing after doing that, um, the A1 and B cells should be incubated with patient serum at four degrees Celsius for 15 to 30 minutes. Um, an auto control, meaning a drop of um, the patient's own red cell suspension and two drops of serum in a tube, as well as O cell control must also be incubated alongside the back type tubes um, for this procedure. Um, incubating at this low temperature may enhance cold agglutinins, so, um, which is where the, the blood will agglutinate in the cold. So these controls are the best um, to test for those to make sure those aren't happening. 
Group two ABO discrepancies are those that have unexpected reactions in the forward or front typing due to either weakly reacting or missing antigens. These discrepancies are very uncommon, but uh, can be caused uh, by either weak A or B subgroups, certain leukemias, and something called the acquired B phenomenon. The acquired B phenomenon shows weak reactions with the anti-B antisera and is uh, associated with intestinal obstruction or malignancy of the digestive tract. So in the ex this example, in this little um, uh, table here on the slide, the patient has a four plus positive reaction um, with the uh, anti-A antisera and a weak reacting two plus positive with anti-B antisera in the front type. So in the back type, this patient has a negative reaction with A1 cells and a four plus reaction, positive reaction with B cells. So this is likely an A patient. Um, we can determine that by the front type here um, with an acquired B. Um, so a lot of people would say, well, why, why is this not a, um, <coughs> pardon me, why is this not an AB patient with just uh, B cells reacting in the back type, right? And so the, the reason for that is if it's a true B person or AB person, you're not going to have this two plus reaction in anti-B. It's going to react pretty strongly. So ABO, ABO typing reacts very strongly. So more than likely, if it was an AB person, it would be four plus, four plus for anti-A and anti-B. So this is kind of suggestive of this acquired um, uh, B phenomenon. So how do we resolve these types of discrepancies? So um, the patient's red blood cell suspension and anisera should be incubated uh, for 15 to 30 minutes at room temperature, then spun and the reaction is graded again. And if it still has not been resolved, then the anisera and the patient cell should be incubated with patient serum at four degrees Celsius for 15 to 30 minutes as well. So an auto control, which we've talked about already, meaning a drop of the patient's own red blood cell suspension and two drops of, of their own serum in a tube, as well as an o, con, o cell control must also be incubated alongside the back type tube. So, and that's to test for the presence of cold agglutinins to make sure that it's actually agglutinating versus um, just, agglutinating because the patient has those antibodies or antigens and not just because the sample is cold. Group 3 ABO discrepancies occur when there are discrepancies between the front and the back type caused by protein or plasma abnormalities that result in either Rouleau or in pseudoglutination. Um, so this can occur when a patient has multiple myeloma or Waldenstrom's macroglobinemia, which are cancers of the white blood cells that cause the patient to produce elevation of globulin proteins. Um, if the patient has been given plasma expanders, so things like dextran, which are uh, things that are given um, via IV to provide um, volume for the circulatory system, this can cause those. Um, and this can also occur with Wharton's jelly, which is found in core blood samples. So this jelly is a gelatinous substance that um, functions to insulate and protect the umbilical cord. So Wharton's jelly is present in core blood samples and um, causes the sample to, to agglutinate, leading to an ABO discrepancy. So I'll talk more about this in other lectures, but Wharton's jelly is why we need to wash cells from core blood um, to get rid of it um, because it can affect our blood typing results. So in this example, in this chart here, the patient has a four plus positive reaction with both the anti-A and anti-B antisera and a weak two plus reaction, positive reaction, with both the A1 and the B cells in the back type. So this is likely an AB patient, um, but has weekly positive reactions in the back type due to real low or pseudoagglutination. And again, the reason that we can determine that is that they have very strong front typing. So they have four plus and anti-A and anti-B and the back type is weak. So that means there's probably an issue with um, the back type and this is an AB patient. Um, so I included these two pictures here to kind of give you an idea of Rouleau versus agglutination. So Rouleau is a stacking of red blood cells. So they kind of look like coins stacked on top of each other. Um, true Rouleau formation can be seen in the picture on the left-hand side of the slide. So this here is Rouleau. You can see it kind of looks like red blood cells like in coins stacked on top of each other. So this is um, 
this is Rouleau. Um, and um, this is commonly seen in patients that have multiple myeloma. Um, so the picture on the right hand side um, shows agglutination, not Rouleau. And this is when the red blood cells are clumped together. So all this, this is here, this is actual uh, agglutination. Um, you see how there's no like stacking of red blood cells like this, right? It doesn't look like that. It's just like a big clump, right? Um, so this is the difference between uh, the two. So usually uh, washing the patient's cells um, several times with saline will help to resolve group three AVO discrepancies. And saline replacement uh, can also be used to disperse Rouleau. Um, saline replacement is uh, performed by removing the patient's serum and replacing it with an equal volume of saline. Um, if the patient has true agglutination, this will not affect it. If typing a uh, cord blood um, sample, washing six to eight times before testing will help to remove the worm's jelly and prevent the discrepancy from happening. Group four ABO discrepancies are discrepancies between the front and back types due to miscellaneous problems. Uh, polyglutination um, is where the patient's red blood cells agglutinate with most uh, normal human serum. This can cause that. Uh, cold reactive autoantibodies can cause this as well. Um, these are antibodies uh, where the red blood cells are heavily coated uh, with antibody and they spontaneously agglutinate. Unexpected ABO isoagglutinins can also cause a group four ABO discrepancy. So an example of this would be um, A2, in A2 and A2B individuals, so a different subgroup of A. Um, and these particular patients can just produce anti-A1 just naturally. So how do we resolve these? So um, the use of monoclonal antibodies and blood banking reagents nowadays has essentially eliminated discrepancies caused by polyagglutination. Uh, for cold reactive antibodies, um, they can be removed using um, autoabsorption um, if the patient has not been recently transfused. So this is a procedure used to remove autoantibodies from the patient's red blood cells. For unexpected ABO isoagglutinins, like when A2 and A2B blood types um, in patients produce a naturally occurring anti-A1 antibody, a serum grouping can be repeated with A1, A2, B cells, and O cells, and also an auto control. Um, the patient's ABO subgroup would also need to be confirmed as well to resolve this type of discrepancy. CIS-AB is when a patient inherits both A and B genes from one parent and an O gene from the other parent. So this is the inheritance of three ABO genes instead of two. Um, this causes a weakly reactive A and B antigen, so the front type will be weaker than normal. So this is also uh, an issue with uh, group four discrepancy. So this uh, concludes the presentation on ABO blood grouping. Uh, if you like this lecture, please remember to like this video and also subscribe to my channel. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, please let, leave them in the comments section.